Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 2, if you would, this morning. Luke, the second chapter. And a couple of things. Uh, while you're finding that, uh, ladies, remember, of course, in the, it's in the bulletin there, but uh, the ladies meeting this coming Tuesday at uh, 7 o'clock. And then our men's breakfast scheduled for this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock. And if you're planning on being at that, uh, make sure you sign up. We're having a work day following that as well. And even if you cannot stay and work, then uh, we'd still love for you to be here for the breakfast and a good time of fellowship for that. Uh, so uh, make sure you sign up for that if you would. And then on this coming Thursday, uh, around 6, 6 o'clock in the evening to 6.30, Brother Larry Ferguson will be delivering our next uh, project for our seed line ministry. And uh, he, this will be uh, at least some. It'll be about ten thousand. We'll be getting sixty thousand John and Romans all together, roughly. But about ten thousand of those uh, will be for a country that we've never done any before, and that'll be uh, for the country of Croatia. And so that'll be a blessing to be able to have a part in that. And then the others will be English that uh, mostly will be sent to uh, English speaking countries in Africa. So uh, uh, he'll be bringing those, and if any of you men are free uh, to come and help uh, unload that between, uh, he said he'd plan to be here around 6, but uh, perhaps 6.30 as well. So if you'd remember that, that'll be a great blessing, and we can get back on that. I know many of you love working on the John and Romans in the seed line uh, ministry, so We'll get started back up on that just as soon as we can uh, get those here. And then Sister Ellen asked us to pray for Brother Brent uh, Cannon. He is deployed uh, to Jordan uh, for a few weeks. And uh, keep him in prayer if you would. And I know they'll be grateful for that. I want to thank you for praying for us, my mom and myself, as we were uh, in North Carolina the past week and uh, with... I'd planned to go anyway, and just some things that I needed to do uh, at her place there. But uh, then we had a funeral that we, uh, one, her, one of her sister-in-laws uh, passed away, and uh, we went to that on Monday. And uh, I especially thank you for uh, praying for us because of this. We got there, and uh, my cousin, uh, of course, it's been a while since I'd seen her. It was her mother that died, and... Uh, she had asked me if I'd be a pallbearer. Uh, one of the fellows that they had lined up for that couldn't make it, so I was glad to do that. And I was setting up, uh, they would seated us down front there in the chapel of the funeral home. And uh, I was sitting there beside my uncle. And uh, in comes the, uh, the, the funeral director. And uh, she said, could you step to the back back here? And I knew right then where we were heading with that because I had heard a couple of times in the back back there uh, somebody asked is the pastor here yet uh, and uh, you know he hadn't arrived and so when she asked that uh, I knew what was about to take place and so I walked back there and my cousin explained to me what was going on and she said could you do this and uh, I said well let's wait just a minute or two and see if he shows up <laughs> And uh, he never did show up. And uh, so I had that, and I've never had that happen before. Uh, so that was sort of thrust on me, but uh, we got through that, and they seemed to be uh, happy about it. And I tried my best to uh, present the gospel and uh, preach a little while, and uh, they seemed to be happy with that. So I thank you for praying. Luke chapter 2, I want to talk about the grace of God a little bit this morning. That's, that's one of my favorite subjects. And uh, I've thought about it uh, quite a bit the last couple of days. And sort of an unusual verse, I guess, to uh, uh, go in that direction. And uh, I've never preached uh, from this. And this is just basically going to be like a, string, a springboard verse. And we'll consider some other things about the grace of God that uh, you've heard before, I know. Uh, but Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in His childhood. Uh, and of, uh, this here, very early in His childhood, there's not much we know 
about the childhood years of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, this is one of the verses that does uh, give us a little bit about that. Verse 40 of Luke chapter 2, it says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we pray that you would help us today as we look into the Word of God and we confess to you that we do need your help. Uh, we need your power. We need your wisdom and strength. We're not sufficient of ourselves. and We readily admit that. And so, Lord, we look to you and we pray that uh, you would fill us with the Spirit of God and help us uh, to rightly divide the Word of truth. And We pray that the Word of God would do the work that needs to be done in our hearts and lives this morning. We pray that if there would be anybody here present that has never trusted Christ Jesus as their Savior, pray that you'd help them to see their need of Him today, and may they come to Him and be saved. And Lord, all of us that are saved, we pray that you'd help us, especially in this matter of growing in the grace of God, and manifesting the grace of God in our lives. We pray that uh, you would use this thy word uh, to instruct us and help us today. And may Christ Jesus be magnified in all that we say and do. In his name we do pray. Amen. If you were to uh, try to find a definition of God's grace, uh, it may be worded differently uh, depending on the source that you're looking at, Bible dictionaries and so forth, but uh, ultimately what it would come down to in uh, simple terms would be basically this, grace is God's unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And that is certainly true. Uh, but here's what I want us to think about uh, primarily this morning. Uh, the grace of God is broader than that simple definition. Uh, it is God's unmerited favor. And uh, that would be true as it applies to us. We don't deserve any of God's goodness. We don't deserve God's love. And uh, any... Any good thing that God provides for us, does for us, is certainly not deserved and it is not merited. Uh, it is only because of uh, His unmerited favor. And so uh, that, that is true of us. But uh, this was an interesting statement here about the Lord Jesus Christ that's sort of intriguing when you think about it. And I've been thinking about it for uh, a little while here. Uh, it says, the grace of God was upon Him. And that would show us that, that God's grace is indeed deeper and broader than His unmerited favor. Uh, the grace of God was upon Him, speaking of Christ. Now, as it relates to Christ, that cannot mean unmerited favor. Because uh, Christ was the sinless one. And there would be no sense whatsoever in which the Lord Jesus did not merit God's favor. He was perfect in all of His ways. Uh, and in every way, the favor of God was upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in, in uh, its application to Christ, God's grace is certainly not unmerited favor. It's favor, but not unmerited. John 1 and verse 14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, was Jesus full of God's unmerited favor? No, nah, not, not at all. Uh, but He was full of God's favor, full of grace in that sense. In Luke uh, 3 and verse 22, it says, The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon Him, speaking of Christ, and a voice from heaven which said... 
Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. There was no area, no, uh, no, no uh, sense in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ at all in which God was not well pleased. And Christ is the only one that that could be true of. In John 8 and verse 29 it says, And he that sent me is with me. This is Jesus speaking. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He's the only one that can make that claim as well. And so uh, because of Christ's perfection, because of his sinless being, uh, because of his purity, uh, in, in every way, because of his own righteousness, uh, the grace of God that was on him was not upon him uh, in uh, that unmerited sense. I do believe, and I uh, think this is clear, that that, uh, that verse would indicate to us that Christ was always in the favor of God. Never a time uh, in which he lost or forfeited uh, the favor that he had of his heavenly Father. Now, <clears throat> it is by God's grace, and that is that unmerited favor, by God's grace we are saved. Amen. No other way, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Once we are saved... We have, for the Christian, we have a standing in the grace of God. And that's one reason why we can know we're saved. One reason why we can have the full and absolute assurance that uh, we have eternal life is because of that standing in the grace of God. Now, again, after we're saved, God desires to manifest His grace in and through us. That's what the Christian life is, uh, is about. We are to grow in grace, as 2 Peter 3 and verse 18 admonishes us to do. And in growing in grace, that, uh, that also would include the idea that we are to grow in our lives uh, being favorable to Him. Now, you can't do that on your own. You can't do that in and of yourself. Now, we'll never in this life reach that state of perfection. We'll never get to the place that we can make the claim that we're sinless. I know there's some people that uh, try to do that, but uh, they're, they're deceived and they seek to deceive others when they say that. Uh, none of us are without sin. And so uh, we're not like Christ in that sense. And we cannot be like Him uh, in His sinless perfection. Uh, but we should have the desire in our hearts that once we are saved and we are established in the grace of God, that our lives are continually becoming more favorable to God. And that's simply uh, known as Christ-likeness. The biblical term is sanctification. We become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as the grace of God operates uh, in our lives. But we can't do that, uh, as I say, in of, our, of ourselves. Uh, it, it requires our submission to God working in us. And God's grace is effected or, or made practical in our lives uh, by our, sub, our, our learning and listening and submitting to His Word. Uh, Brother John mentioned in Sunday school in here this morning about the importance, the necessity of the Word of God in God guiding us and leading us in our decision making and so forth. 
Listen to Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. We read this, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. The word of His grace, which is able to build you up. Now, are you being built up in your life by the word of God's grace? That should be taking place in all of our lives if we're saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, listen to Paul's testimony here. He said, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Uh, God's able to do that. All grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God's grace is available to us in abundance. And it is to be manifested in our lives in abundance. This is one of the things that I was thinking about earlier <clears throat> in uh, thinking and meditating on the grace of God. And, and uh, you know, bring it down to a personal level. Is the grace of God being manifested in my life in an abundant way? Boy, it should be, shouldn't it? Uh, my life, your life, if you're saved, should be a testimony to the abundant working and power of the grace of God that He's provided for us. And so, uh, in, in the first place, that is uh, true in practical Christian living. God's grace in practical Christian living. Uh, day by day. Just, just the, the normal Christian life is God's grace being manifested in yours and in mine. Again, listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Paul, Paul's uh, giving his own personal testimony there that uh, he's had his conversation, his manner of life, his, his uh, lifestyle will be a word that uh, we use a lot today. He said, that's been abundant toward you by the grace of God. Paul's life was a testimony to the effectual working and power of God's grace in his life. Now, yes, initially that was manifested in God's unmerited favor. Paul didn't deserve salvation any more than you do or I do. He was saved by grace. Uh, we're saved by grace, that unmerited favor. But uh, since he got saved, he allowed God to work in his heart and life uh, to the point that God's grace was manifested and really it was on exhibition. It was on display in His life continually. And that's the way it's to be with us too. And there are a couple of things uh, practically again that uh, come to mind here that I'd like for us to think about just uh, for a minute or two anyway. Uh, God's grace enables us to have a proper view of ourselves. You know, I'm finding more and more that uh, problems that people have, problems that I have, a lot of times, if not most of the time, can be traced to self. And uh, a misconception or uh, uh, an opinion of self that is not right. In Romans 12 and verse 3, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Amen. And again, that would take care of a lot of things right there, wouldn't it? Amen. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, if we miss or we ignore or we neglect or take for granted the grace of God in our lives, we're very likely 
to end up having a false opinion about ourselves. We'll do just the opposite of what uh, we're told to do there in Romans 12 and verse 3. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And that really is an attitude that uh, ultimately leads us to think that we are better than others. We like to elevate ourselves, don't we? We like to promote ourselves. And that kind of thinking will often lead to an ingratitude towards God. If, uh, if I neglect the, the, the reality of God's grace in my life, then it won't be long before I'm going to be characterized by uh, ungratefulness, unthankful in my life. Listen to uh, 2 Timothy 3. You remember what he says. Uh, by the way, gratitude. Gratitude to God is a great motivation to serve Him and to live for Him. And I can't help but wonder sometimes, if you know, we preachers, uh, sometimes we try to pump and prime and we try to do everything to get people to do right, people to live right, people to uh, live in obedience to God and just simply uh, live to His honor and glory. And I wonder often if uh, people were just simply as thankful as they should be for the grace of God that's been manifested to them in Christ, that right there would motivate them to be faithful to serve Him. Amen. But ingratitude, boy, it's a problem. Uh, it's widespread. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul uh, prophesied the day uh, that would be characterized by ingratitude. In verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, This know also that in the last days peril, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And the thing that we should be most thankful for is God's grace in our lives manifested in Christ. And, and if I, if you are truly grateful to God for the salvation that He's given us, would that not motivate us to want to live for Him and honor Him and glorify Him in our lives? But you know as well, all you got to do is just look around and you'll see that we live in a day when uh, ungratefulness, ingratitude is rampant. Our daughter, <clears throat> Tracy, she teaches first grade down in Fayetteville in a Christian school. And, uh, of course, she was there with us. She spent her spring break helping me. Uh, and I'm in debt. I'm in debt to her now uh, because of that. But uh, she was glad to do it. But we were talking and... Uh, uh, she said that this group of first graders that she's had this year uh, is the most selfish and ungrateful class that she has ever had. She's been teaching, I think, nine years now. Uh, and, and she gave this an example. She took them on a field trip the other day to Krispy Kreme. Makes me want to be a first grader again. <laughs> Uh, and I think she said, and I don't know, they started down there in North Carolina somewhere. And I think she said that it was the first Krispy Kreme uh, donut place that uh, they ever built. And she took her kids there, and they all got free donuts. I wouldn't mind that, would you? <laughs> free donuts, good health food. Uh, <laughs> we can indulge in that, I think. But, you know, they gave them the, the glazed kind. Amen. And she said the kids fussed and complained all the way back because they weren't the chocolate-covered kind. They weren't the uh, filled. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain they were talking about the lemon-filled kind. As <laughs> far as I'm concerned, there is none other. Uh, but they didn't get that. They just got the, the plain glazed and, and uh, fussed and complained about it the whole time. Uh, she said that uh, 
Another day she had bought them, bought them some Skittles, and she paid for this out of her own pocket. Bought, and that's not a big expense. But uh, bought them Skittles, and she was going to use them. Uh, some type of object lesson she was doing uh, in her class. And she said the same thing. Said they, they fussed and complained because the Skittles were the wrong flavor. Uh, out, just complaining all the time. She said that's been characteristic of them the whole year. And I wonder if those first graders might not get that uh, ungrateful attitude honestly. Because there are a lot of adults the same way today. And I would uh, venture to say that there are a lot of adult Christians that are ungrateful Amen. and unthankful. And we certainly live in a day when, when self is enthroned. Did you notice back in 2 Timothy, the verse that I read there, uh, the, the, the connection there between boasting and pride and, and unthankfulness? He mentions it in the same context there. And we live in a day when self is enthroned. And there's an attitude of entitlement even as it relates to God. God owes me. That's the way some people think. And the truth is, were it not for the grace of God for which we should be ever thankful, if we got what we were entitled to, We'd either be in hell or on our way there. And we ought to be thankful that God has manifested His grace to us in saving us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, grace will help us have a right opinion, a right uh, attitude toward ourselves. We'll realize that we, we are not, we have no grounds to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think because we are all sinners and if we're saved, we're saved by the grace of God and that alone. Uh, something else is this, and I'm, again I'm talking about practical uh, grace in our Christian lives. Gro growing in favor with God. Is that happening in our lives? It, will our lives be progressing in such a way that God is more and more pleased with us? Now the Lord Jesus Christ was able to say, I do always those things that please Him. That, now we can't say that. But we should be able to say that because of God's grace, because of His uh, love and His mercy to us, and because of what He's made available to us in Christ, we should be growing in favor with God day by day in the practical sense. And grace should govern our relationship with others. And, and in one particular area, and there are other things, but this one just uh, I was thinking about in Colossians 4 and verse 6. He says, let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now that is certainly Christ-like. Because it says this in Luke 4 and verse 22, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Now wouldn't it be wonderful if that could be said about us? Uh, folks, one, I'm talking about practical Christian living now. Our words... Our conversation, uh, our speech should be that that manifests the grace of God and as Paul described there, seasoned with salt. And just as the Lord Jesus always <clears throat> had the favor of God upon His life, our speech should be such that it always would bring God's favor. Uh, and really, you think about it, there are only two options here. Uh, speech, uh, conversation that would bring God's favor, be, be favorable to God, or speech that God would disapprove in our lives. Wh which is it? You say, well, I can't, uh, I can't control my tongue. 
Ah, no, no, no. That's just a vain, empty excuse. Uh, through the Holy Spirit, that can certainly be done. And our speech, and I, I, I've heard people before, you know, claim to be saved and they use vile language. They use, uh, uh, you know, profanity. That ought never be found in the coming from the tongue of a believer. And our speech should never be characteristic of the unsaved. Uh, crude, um, cruel, and, and, and corrupt. That would characterize the way lost people talk, wouldn't it? I mean, just common. He says it should be seasoned with salt. Salt, of course, has a purifying and a preserving effect. I guess they still do, but I know uh, folks used to, uh, when they'd kill hogs and, and uh, you know, prepare the hams and everything, uh, they'd rub them down with salt, and boy, they'd last for a long time. Amen. Uh, used on meat to prevent decay and corruption. Is that what our uh, speech, our conversation would be like? That which is corrupt, Ephesians 4 and verse 29 says, Let no corrupt, communica uh, co corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Are you growing in favor with God in the way you talk? Uh, in, in your conversation? You know, there's some people, they can't uh, uh, utter a sentence without some type of profanity. I was reading an article just a few days ago. One of these uh, uh, high school students down in Florida where the shooting was, and he's become a celebrity now because uh, they're, they're anti-gun, anti-NRA, and everything that goes along with that. And uh, I think, well, I know he was one of the ones on front of Time magazine cover and been on the news and everything. And I, was, I started to read something uh, about uh, him the other day and some of the uh, interviews that he had given. And honestly, I, I quit reading it. Uh, it was full of profanity. Uh, that's not, that, that should not be true in uh, the life of the believer. There's no, no excuse for that. And uh, the, the, the corruption. Are we growing in grace, uh, are we growing in favor with God in the way uh, we speak and so forth? Uh, that you say, you know, I come to church this morning to hear about how I should talk. Well, that's in the Bible, isn't it? And uh, did not Jesus say that uh, what comes out of the mouth reveals what's in the heart? Out of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaketh. And so, if, if I'm not right with God, if I'm full of self in my heart, then it's going to uh, manifest itself in my life. And God's not going to be pleased with that. Uh, God is pleased with uh, talk and speech and communication that uh, manifests His grace and uh, has that uh, preserving and purifying quality uh, to it as it is seasoned with salt. Another thing is this. Again, practical uh, living. Grace instructs us uh, concerning godly living. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And I'll tell you this, we're coming to the day when uh, uh, the average uh, person doesn't want to hear anything about that anymore. Amen. They want to come to church and uh, hear something that's going to make them feel good. Paul spoke about it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, teachers having itching ears, and they're going to turn away their ears from the truth. But God's grace, when it is uh, understood as it's 
uh, revealed in the Bible, the grace of God will teach us we're supposed to live godly. We're supposed to live righteously in this present world. Uh, the, the grace of God teaches and instructs us that our lives are to be different and distinct from the evil that's in this world. Now that doesn't mean we think we're better than everybody else. That goes back to Romans 12 and verse 3. Don't, don't think that you're better than somebody else just because you're saved. No, no. Don't think you're better than somebody else just because in your mind you may be more dedicated and more devoted than the other people are. No. Uh, we must always remember, like Paul said, uh, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If his life was anything that God would be pleased with, Paul understood that it was because of God's grace to begin with. So we're not talking about uh, uh, the attitude that because you do things or you don't do things that other people might do or don't do, that that makes you better than them. No. But it is a matter of wanting God's favor, wanting God to be pleased with our lives. And, and the distinction that uh, is to be present in the life of the believer would include denying ungodliness, Denying worldly lust, worldly desires, living soberly. That's not just talking about not getting drunk and that type of thing. That's talking about our mind. Be, being sound minded. We think right. We don't allow this world to dictate to us how we think. And boy, we're doing a lot of that, aren't we? Uh, we, we allow God in His Word to govern and guide us uh, in our thinking and, and in our behavior. And so God's grace is to be manifested in our lives in a practical way. We're to be growing in that grace, growing in favor with God as His grace uh, controls us more and more and more. Day by day. Another thing is this. God's grace includes... Now, it does uh, involve and include His unmerited favor. But don't forget, it, it's broader than that. Uh, God's grace uh, includes God's enabling power in our lives. That would especially include God's power in difficult times and difficult circumstances in our lives. And we've preached on this often before, really not too long ago, this, this same passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, Paul's thorn in the flesh. And he says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Boy, isn't that a wonderful statement God gives us? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul's response is this, Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, God's grace in His strength, uh, His power, or, or, or God's grace really is, in, in this regard here, in this application, God's grace is His strength. It is His power available to us and enabling us uh, empowering us in our weakness. Uh, there are a lot of things in life that you experience that uh, you, you get to the place to where you, you just have to uh, admit, I can't, I can't do this. I can't endure this. I, I can't uh, uh, see this through in my own strength. 
And I, I'll not ask for a show of hands or anything, but I would, I would be surprised if most of us that have been saved any length of time at all have not been to that point in our lives. We, we use the term, I come to the end of my rope. Uh, you ever been there? And, and you recognize, I just, I just can't do this. Aren't you glad that God's grace is available? That God's grace will, will help and, and will strengthen in your weakness? That's, that's exactly what he said to Paul there. Uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, somebody's going to have to acknowledge weakness, aren't they? Uh, and that's, that's got to be us. If God's strength, if His grace is to be manifested, then we've got to realize that uh, we're not sufficient of ourselves. And we're wise to remember that those times when we get that way are really, in reality, God's opportunities uh, to magnify His power, His strength, magnify Himself in and through us. And Paul's uh, attitude... Uh, certainly reveals the attitude we should have. In verse 9 he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. I, I don't believe I've got to that point yet uh, when I can say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Now I hope I'm learning that. I, I, I hope that I am growing in that capacity to where... I can acknowledge and even rejoice in my own weakness so that God can manifest and reveal His strength, His power uh, in and through me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, Paul says, uh, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress is for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Now let's remember that's where God desires that all of us be. He, he desires that we recognize our weakness so that He can manifest His grace, His strength uh, to us. Also in Hebrews 4 and verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. Why? That we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In our time of need, there is grace to help. Where would you be without that? Uh, where, where, where would you be in your Christian life, given what some of you have been called upon to endure, and uh, so many times you have come to the end of your rope, and you realize that you cannot in your own strength endure that, and you have found that there is grace to help in that time of need. And sometimes we allow our own attitude of self-reliance, our self-sufficiency, to cause us to be slow to admit our need. And we allow our pride to hinder us from admitting that we need help. But that's where God wants us to come. Uh, he wants us. Matter of fact, that's what Hebrews 4 is all about. He's encouraging us, admonishing us to come boldly. And that doesn't mean brashly. That means with confidence, with assurance that we can find. We come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when we do not acknowledge our need of help to God, then we miss that opportunity for God to manifest Himself and His grace to us 
And we really foolishly attempt to continue to bear the burden and endure, endure the trial by ourselves. And I, I say again, that is a very foolish thing to do. Uh, because that is going to hinder God uh, from manifesting Himself to us. Uh, <clears throat> that is also true, this matter of God's grace being sufficient. It is true when it comes to service and labor. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10 says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth there on, but let every man take heed how he buildeth there on, thereupon. Uh, labor and service. That, uh, we, we depend upon God's grace to do that faithfully in our lives. In Ephesians 3 and verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me, by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I'm of the opinion that apart from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the Apostle Paul has been the greatest preacher that's ever lived uh, in the human race. Uh, and right there, he acknowledges himself that his preaching, his service was only because of the grace of God. Now thank God for people who serve. Uh, thank God for people who labor in the ministry. And uh, I, I could name people here in this church been faithful for years and years and years. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, you know, never get their name called out or anything like that. Uh, they do that because it is God's grace that has worked in their hearts and uh, that's been effectual in their lives and they rejoice to be able to serve. But I would imagine that there's uh, all of us, no matter what we do in the work of the ministry, uh, I would I'd venture to say that uh, at some point in time, all of us has come to the place to where we, we've been ready to say, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm through with this. Uh, I, we come to the place that uh, we despair. And we're ready to quit. Uh, <clears throat> I, when we were down at my mom's this past week, there's a preacher friend of mine. We went to school together, graduated uh, from high school together, went to Bible college. About to, well, I was there a little bit uh, before he was, and he came later, and, uh, you know, been a friend over the years, and he's been pastoring there in the area, oh, I don't know, probably close to 30 years, if not more. He came over uh, to visit with us uh, one night this past week, and here's what he said. He said, I have never felt more incompetent in ministry than I am now. And I'll be honest with you, I can relate. I told him, I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. We live in a, we live in a rough day. Uh, we live in a cold day. We live in a hard day. We live in a day when Christians that used to be committed to Christ no longer are. And uh, people that used to serve God and be faithful to God no longer do that. That's discouraging. And that will take a toll really on, on any uh, pastor, any, any preacher. And when he told me that, I got to thinking about it. And we need the reality of the grace of God in our lives if we're going to serve Him. I mean, if you got it in your mind... Uh, if you've never been involved in uh, serving the Lord in the ministry of a local church and you're thinking about it, uh, you can be assured of this. Uh, you're going to have some difficulties. <laughs> uh, it, it's, 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 it's not an easy thing. And I'm not saying that uh, to uh, try to appeal to, to your pity or anything like that at all. That is just the way things are. And... It magnifies 
or at least in my mind, from myself. Uh, it magnifies my need of growing in grace day by day. And I need to continue, all of us do, I believe, we need to continue to allow God to work in our hearts and lives in His grace. Otherwise, uh, we're going to become disheartened. We'll get to the place of despair. And uh, we very possibly could quit on Him. And that's not where He wants us, is it? Uh, he wants us to serve Him and live for Him and honor Him and glorify Him. Quickly, my time is about gone, but let me mention this. This really is the beginning uh, when we're thinking about grace. And this goes back to the unmerited aspect of God's grace. Uh, we must make sure that we have our standing in the grace of God. In other words, we need to make sure that we're saved. In Romans 5 and verse 2 it says, By whom also we, uh, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Uh, that's, our, that's our eternal standing. He says this in Romans 3 and verse 24, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification is a state of being. Being justified. Uh, the believer does not hope to one day become justified. Uh, being a Christian is not working and working and, and uh, trying to do your best and hopefully one day you'll, you'll do enough and God will justify you. No, 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 no being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is a state of being and it's not a goal to strive for. We are justified by His grace. That's one of the great differences between a work salvation and Bible salvation. Or I should say a works religion, works-based religion and Bible Salvation as it's taught in the Word of God. Ephesians 2, you know it. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, salvation in Christ is the foundation upon which our lives, our, our works are to be built. And to try to live a life of good works without a standing in Christ will prove to be fruitless and vain and ultimately tragic for all eternity. This is a, a weak illustration, but it's something fresh on my mind, so I thought I'd, I'd use it. Uh, one of the things that I needed to do when we were down in North Carolina is my, my aunt and uncle, actually it belongs to all of my, my mother's, uh, well, her and brothers and sisters and so forth. The house that uh, my grandpa and grand, uh, grandmother bought back in 1946, uh, you know, they lived in it all the time ever since I remember till they died. And then my mom's oldest sister uh, lived in it till she was 92. She died about four years ago and it's been empty since then. And, of course, that's not good for it. And I've got an aunt and uncle that uh, live right below my mom. And uh, they've been taking care of it. And uh, they're both getting up in years. And they're just not able to do that anymore. So they need to try to sell it. And uh, they called the other day and wanted to know if uh, I wanted some of the furniture out of it. And it was a bedroom suit that my mom had bought her mother back in the 40s or the 50s. I can't remember now. Oh, it's an antique. And, of course, we didn't have room for it or anything, but Tracy said she'd like it, so I needed to go down there and get that. And well, we loaded it up and transported it down to Fayetteville. And uh, I, I thought I had it. I, 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 I tried to do things the cheap way. Instead of renting a U-Haul, uh, I hauled it in a trailer and uh, thought I had it strapped down real secure and 
covered with tarps and everything in case it rained. And uh, I'd gone about 18 miles, got down to Hickory, North Carolina, and I felt like Jed Clampett going down the interstate. Uh, tarp flying everywhere. Uh, furniture looked like it was shifting. And uh, man, you talk about feeling like a fool. I did. And so I pulled into uh, the Cracker Barrel down there. They had a big parking lot. And I just took my knife. And uh, that stuff, I, I thought I had it secure as far as that tarp goes, covering everything, tightened down real good. Uh, and I thought I had it airtight, but I didn't. And uh, it didn't take but just a little wind to get in that. And uh, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And by the time I stopped, it was ripped all to pieces, doing no good whatsoever. And I just took my knife and cut it all off and uh, forgot about and I'm glad it wasn't raining. It was clear, uh, good weather that day. And... Uh, went on our way. I sent Tracy to buy four more straps and uh, strapped it down again. Went a little ways and I saw it starting to shift again. And uh, between there and Fayetteville, I probably stopped six or seven times uh, to try to secure that furniture, that old antique stuff I was hauling in a trailer uh, down to her house. And uh, never did. If I'd had a few more miles to go, I would have had to stop and just unload it and, and redo it from, from the start. And I told Tracy when we got there, I said, there's a good lesson in this. I said, you better make sure that you start right, you have a good foundation. It doesn't matter what you do after that. If, if the foundation, if the beginning is not right, then whatever you add to it after that, it's going to fall apart. Uh, and that's exactly the way life is. You better make sure that you're on the solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be a good moral person. You can be a religious person. You could work your fingers to the bone serving others. But apart from Christ, that's all going to be in vain. And it will not mean one thing in eternity. doesn't have to be that way. Because God sent His only begotten Son Amen. to die for the sins of this world. And by recognizing yourself as a guilty sinner and believing that God's grace, that unmerited favor... Uh, God has extended to you in Christ and by trusting in Him and coming to Him by faith, uh, you can be established on that solid foundation of the Lord Jesus. And for those of us that are, our, our, the desire of our hearts should be that we grow in grace. We grow in favor with God in these practical, everyday uh, situations in life, uh, we grow in God's favor. Uh, and that's all because of His grace. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we're grateful for the grace of God that has been shown to us in Christ. Thank you for the truth that we do have that standing in Him. And Lord, we're grateful for the salvation that you provided us in the Lord Jesus. And I pray that you'd help every believer, all of us who are saved. May the de desire of our hearts, the passion of our souls be that we are continually becoming more like Christ in our lives day by day. Lord, we pray that we would allow the grace of God to work effectually in us. May this word of grace, the word of God, may it build us up day by day. Help us to love you. And may the desire of our hearts be to serve you because you first loved us. 
And again, Lord, if there's anybody that does not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, we pray that this might be the day that they come to Him. In Jesus' name and for His sake we do pray. Amen.